<laughs> then I think we shall start. It, it's, it's a nice today that we have Jim Olen, who will make uh, the presentation today about what's going on with the climate in the North Atlantic and the variability. So um, after Jim has made his presentation for half an hour, we will have open up for questions. So Jim, are you ready? Yeah. And, go, go ahead, Jenny. I'll make a pitch that the uh, atmosphere variability is a strong driver for the North Atlantic that you're all working on. And uh, my, my most recent pitch is that uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, extreme events of different types in, uh, in the last couple of years. And that this is actually a, a stronger indication of uh, the rate of change going, in, going on in the Arctic compared to uh, trends uh, in individual uh, variables. Next slide. So the, here's the schematic on how I'm thinking about it this, this day, that we have climate change going on, increasing CO2 is a ultimate driver, but uh, this is uh, impacting our amplification, both uh, uh, temperatures uh, three times the rate of uh, uh, the rest of the world and loss of sea ice. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but you know, on the atmospheric circulation part, we're not really seeing uh, trends. If you look at the R oscillation or the North Atlantic oscillation, but what you have uh, say in the polar vortex and uh, other storms is they naturally have a very large range of variability on their own. And so what's, what's different now is you combine that natural range of variability in the arc circulation with our amplification and that and that's how we're getting these new uh, extremes in, in uh, permafrost and wildfires and erosion and, and uh, sea ice. So now you have these new extremes and uh, there's a real philosophical point of view. Uh, what how do you interpret something you've never seen before? Uh, a classic statistical uh, approach says, well, there's some distribution and, and you have a now, now a new outlier, but what if you have additional information like the fact that you have climate change and our amplification uh, so you have additional forcing or uh, that, that you have the interaction of different uh, 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 physics going on between, between the storms and, and the sea ice. So you, you have new mechanisms going on. So uh, what, what you can say is that we see more extremes, but uh, uh, they're actually less predictable in terms of type and, and timing and, and location. And once you have these new extremes that interacts with the life history, uh, the many uh, animals are, are tuned to the natural variability of the uh, Arctic, but uh, 
when you combine that with uh, the R amplification, you have the interaction there. So we don't necessarily have an impact every year. It's the way of thinking about it is you increase the frequency of uh, the uh, impacts. Next slide. So in terms of the atmospheric variability, both the jet stream and the lower atmosphere and the polar vortex up there, they, they, they can go from more elliptical shape. The jet stream here is shown in, in white that, that often tra traps the cold air over the central Arctic. But then in, in other months or other years, we have this wavy jet stream that can bring warm air from the south or uh, take cold air from the north and spread it south. And uh, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so a lot of the interaction is in months and years that, that looks more like the right side wavy jet stream. Next slide. So one, one new extreme that uh, we've seen fairly recently is you've, you've had melting temperatures at the North Pole <laughs> during winter and uh, this follows the plan where we we have less ice in the North Atlantic, and when you have ice, uh, it cuts off the uh, energy for the storms. But if there's no ice, the storms can reach farther north, and then uh, it, it brings more warm temperatures to the north. It melts more ice and uh, it's a positive feedback that uh, by, net, by now uh, that chain reaction can reach all the way to the North Pole. Uh, next slide. And you guys know a lot more about what's going on in, in the Barents Sea, but uh, uh, you know, there, there's <clears throat> a lot of these extremes are in the last couple of years, but the Barents Sea has been uh, changing for uh, a couple of decades. Here's the heat content in the Western uh, Barents Sea. But, but I also point out that this is also event driven rather than a, a steady, uh, uh, trend, you see several spikes there when when uh, the interaction is going and, and it's these individual events that drag the whole Arctic to new places. Next slide. Uh, here's the Greenland melt on the left side in green. And there, there's a, a downward trend all along there. But if you look closely uh, in the last decade, the points are closer together. I and mean, in the previous uh, decade, they're a little farther apart. What's going on here is uh, you can have uh, high pressure uh, over Greenland in, in some years. And when you have high pressure, the winds flow clockwise around that high pressure. And that gives southerly winds uh, up the west coast of Greenland and, and increases the, the melt. And so there, there's a nice paper that shows uh, the strength of the high pressure in the graph on the x-axis and in the runoff 
uh, on the y-axis. And so uh, like 2019 with the red dot, you had the strong high pressure uh, <clears throat> and that would that corresponding to a year when you had uh, more uh, ice melt, but ju just like uh, uh, the Barents in North Atlantic, uh, you you have the change, but you accelerate in certain years when it's reinforced by the atmospheric, the particular atmospheric wavy wavy pattern. Next slide. Uh, and the, these patterns, uh, you know, influence uh, uh, other main events. Normally, the west to east flow of the jet stream always blows hurricanes out to sea in the Atlantic. But uh, uh, in Hurricane Sandy, you had one of these high pressure blocking patterns over uh, Greenland and it was was part of that four four pattern waving us over the whole Arctic that that tends to get locked in uh, for multiple weeks and steered the sandy storm on onto shore with the devastating, effects. Uh, the picture on the right, there used to be a boardwalk in front of those houses. So uh, next slide. Uh, one of my colleagues, Edward Hanna, has done a lot with uh, this uh, Greenland blocking pattern. And, and in the upper left, for winter temperatures, if you don't have the strong jet stream, uh, that allows cold air to uh, linger over uh, Europe. Uh, <clears throat> and in the southern picture, or the lower left, uh, you, you have uh, a North Atlantic oscillation and it's negative, uh, which has the southern jet, the jet stream far south in Europe in winter, but in the lower right in, in summer, that, that jet is, uh, gives uh, a wet uh, Europe uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, summer. Uh, next slide. Uh, one interesting feature when you have this zonal strong jet stream over the Atlantic is uh, it has a favored uh, latitude that it likes to be. It's not just a nice Gaussian distribution and, and uh, uh, my friend Richard Hall uh, and some, some other people have worked on that. Uh, for variability over North America, whether you have the zonal uh, west to east flow or a more wavy jet stream is, is the main thing we look at, but work by uh, Timo Vima in, in uh, Finland uh, is shown there are a lot of different ways you can get warm and cold uh, events over, over Europe. It's, uh, uh, there's a whole smorgasbord of, of different uh, patterns. So next slide. So the the uh, polar vortex in the lower uh, or upper atmosphere and, and uh, the jet stream uh, are somewhat connected. The polar vortex is important because it tends to have 
more persistence. So if you're looking for uh, events happening mu uh, multiple weeks or an impact over a season, you look at that. And so, and, and it often hangs out over the central uh, Arctic, but it can move over the continent. So in winter, spring 2020, uh, the polar vortex reinforced the uh, jet stream well over uh, Eurasia. And uh, when you combine the, the, the winds being on a southerly, uh, in, in a southerly location uh, with the dryness and, and increased temperature, you ended up with uh, the severe wildfires and permafrost uh, over uh, uh, Central, Central Asia and uh, uh, new, new records uh, there. That southerly track to uh, the jet stream uh, <coughs> uh, ended up so you didn't have a, a wavy jet stream that could bring cold air over northern Siberia, which would be more typical in, in winter. So this was a real major different event. Next slide. And uh, <clears throat> if the Polar vortex is really weak. You can get high pressure in the lower atmosphere and, and in the upper part of the map, those contours are a high pressure and the winds flow uh, clockwise around that. And, and so with that location of the high north of Scandinavia, it pulls the cold Arctic air right from the central Arctic down over Europe. And so in, in the beast from the East case, you know, you had, you had the cold air over all of Europe into Italy and, and uh, uh, England. Next slide. So looking for the future, uh, here's the latest uh, projections from the, from the new set of models uh, with the uh, uh, global on the left and annual uh, our temperatures in the, in the middle. So uh, the uh, temperatures are projected to be at least twice the rate in the Arctic as, as the global. The other thing I always like to point out is we're locked in to the temperature increases until uh, mid-century. Uh, and then uh, what happens after that depends upon which scenario uh, you're, uh, uh, you pick. So. Uh, we're pretty much locked into, uh, you know, at least four degrees uh, annual increase and, and a larger increase in winter for the Arctic. On the right is uh, the uh, sea ice projections. Uh, if uh, if we do a whole lot of mitigation, uh, you know, we won't completely lose the sea ice, but uh, uh, in the real world and in, in the black, uh, sea ice is uh, leaving faster than what the models are saying. And, and the reason for that is the, the models are not very good at getting the wavy jet streams or the interaction of multiple processes that I brought up that are causing these 
these new extreme events. So next slide. So summing up again on uh, uh, <clears throat> my overview, what, what I'm claiming now is we have our amplification that are changing the uh, precursor conditions in terms of ice loss and temperature and permafrost. This interacts with the normal large range of natural variability of the uh, uh, atmosphere uh, wind patterns. And this creates a new extremes. And if you're looking for uh, social and ecological uh, ecosystem impacts, you need to look at the life history of what's going on. A lot of the Arctic species are, are tuned to the natural uh, climate variability uh, year, year, year. They, they like cold temperatures left over from the ice age. And so they're, they're tuned to have uh, several good year classes every decade. They don't have to have a good, good year every year. And so uh, one I'm familiar with in, in the Czech Sea are ribbon seals that need sea ice in uh, May and June for uh, molting and pupping. And, and so now they get, uh, uh, or previously they get maybe two really warm, less ice years in a decade. And we have poor year classes then, but they would have several uh, more typical uh, year classes within a decade. But if, uh, if the uh, uh, if we have extreme sea ice loss in the Bering Chuck Sea like we did in 2018 and 19, if we had more like four five uh, warm years out of a decade, this would uh, severely uh, curtail the number of good year classes they can have. So. Uh, that, that's how uh, these uh, new extreme events can interact with life histories and fisheries pretty much works the same way with uh, uh, these year classes. So, uh, so I'm saying that, that these new sets of, of uh, rare events are a, a new good measure to to uh, point out uh, how rapidly the changes are occurring in uh, uh, <clears throat> in the Arctic. Uh, we're seeing more of them, but in terms of the type and where they occur and and when they occur. Uh, is not really predictable because we're we're in a new uh, new situation beyond where we've uh, can use uh, historical uh, frequencies for these these events because we haven't seen them uh, seen them before. So uh, I think I can stop there. Okay, thank you. Bob, are you there? Do you want to take over and, uh, and lead the discussion? Okay. Then go, ahead. I continue. go ahead, go ahead. I'll yeah? stand by. That's okay. I saw there was a chat comment uh, from Jack. Jack, do you want to say something to the... Sure. I was just pointing out that uh, some of my colleagues and I just published a paper expanding on the work uh, of Hannah and colleagues. And the story is that uh, the blocking in the green light sheet is helping 
contribute to the darkening of the percolation zone, so further enhancing the melt of the green ice sheet. Short story is the blocking does two things. It, uh, it reduces the number of snowstorm events during the summer so that the snow gets older and the grains get bigger and then less clouds also increase the downwelling shortwave, which further enhances the grain growth. And so as a, as a surface fern gets larger and larger grains, the albedo drops and that makes it more prone to melt. So Jim was talking quite a bit about the blocking phenomenon, how important that is in the whole system. Mm. That, that's a good point, Jack. And, and what you're bringing up is, uh, you know, there are multiple processes going on that feedback in them on themselves that accelerates the whole uh, issue. So just, you know, picking one uh, warming temperature uh, is, is not enough uh, physics to explain uh, why things are changing so rapidly as, as you uh, point out the multiple processes. Right, and I just, this paper just was published in this week, so I thought I'd point it out. I'm, I'm sure no one's seen it yet. <laughs> oh, unless they happen to be reviewers. That's good. Well, as you know, in these days, today and tomorrow, the Arctic Council is gathered in Iceland, and I know that AMAP is preparing an update on the climate and pollution. And in the climate, they say that comparing to the what Bob Corell and we presented in 2004 with Arctic climate impact assessment, we concluded that the Arctic was warming twice the globe. The conclusion today is that the globe, the Arctic is warming three times the globe. So um, that fits into your presentation, Jim, what we can expect. Yeah, in the future. And I, I think that's due to these interactions that are not really well uh, seeing in, in uh, the climate model. So uh, relying on, on different sets of observations uh, is a real way to think about uh, what's going on in the, in the art. And uh, the Barent Sea is already there. Yep. You're welcome to take the floor. Oh, Paul. Yes, uh, I have a question. It's more a pedagogic question than a scientific one. If uh, the trend uh, for the future is given by the tr extremes uh, and the extremes are non-predictable, uh, then it is much more difficult for us to explain uh, what direction we go. Uh, if you have a trend line through, let's say, uh, over 10, 20 years, you can say, oh, this is the way it goes. But if you have to convince somebody on the street to say, well, um, the, uh, the various beasts of the East, uh, if they arrive, they are, so to say, the trend which shows the future, that it's much more difficult to explain. Have you any advice there, Jim? Um, some, there, there are... Uh, there are people around like Ted Shepard and, and uh, contributors uh, actually to the IPCC cli uh, cryosphere report uh, okay. that, that says the way you really should do this is thinking about multiple scenarios. So uh, you... Uh, <clears throat> You, you can use previous extreme events to say these are going to be more frequent uh, uh, and, and build up uh, scenarios uh, that way. But that's, uh, uh, <clears throat> that, that's one way that people are thinking about how to, it, really, it really is upping the uncertainty as you as you say, in terms of specifics, but uh, you know, I think you can you can use the models to say the drivers 
will still be there, but then uh, in terms of uh, uh, <clears throat> sea ice or permafrost or, or various uh, impacts, it's uh, 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 use, use different scenarios as uh, the, the possibil possibilities and and, and say, well, the, you know, the range is from moderate to extreme uh, and that we're not likely to have a, a real nice scenario. Thank you. I see that Mike has a hand up here. Um, yeah, actually, I wanna, it, 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 let's see. I want to well, follow up uh, at least a little bit on what it was what Paul was sort of saying, you know, I mean, what's really strange, I don't know why we're having an echo here. Um, what's really strange is that the international accords are all based on rise in the global average temperature, where the global average temperature is it, that they have is typically averaged over at least a decade, maybe two decades in time. So they're talking about the change in the average. And, and of course, variability is gonna be creeping in. So if you have the global average at one and a half, we're gonna have years that are gonna be well above that in terms of global average. And the impacts that we talk about really, in most cases are not related to the to the multi-decade average change in temperature. I mean, you don't have coral bleaching and the coral don't sit there and try and figure out what the 10-year average or 20-year average of the temperature is, just as ice sheet or glaciers and other things don't sit there. You get, you get this variability in extremes. And so, uh, I mean, the, it, it's just very misleading, it seems to me, to me, or very, I don't know, some sort of missed representation of things to be be having these international discussions focus about change in global average temperature when you're talking not just about average over the globe but average over a, a decade or longer um, so with it being extremes as Paul was commenting that are causing most of the impacts it's it's just I think we really need to be working on what our terminology should be uh, in particular, I was, I was concerned, Jim, about it, and you talked a little about it, about calling it, you had natural variability up there. And, and when, you, when you talk about it as variability or extremes, people don't somehow gather that that's, that's part of change um, and, and everything. And so I, I think we're having you know, problems getting across the notion of of change because people sort of interpret that as everybody should be experiencing the same thing at the same time in a gradual change. And that's just not what happens and what causes impacts, so. Right. Yeah, I think that, that's why I'm on this uh, hobby horse for looking at uh, extremes. And uh, I think, think the key point is, uh, you know, for the, Ecosystems, the, uh, the impacts relate to the uh, extreme based on the life history of the animals. Yeah, Bob, do you? Yeah, yeah. Bob has to sign. Yeah, could, could I share the screen for a second? Let's see if it works. Well, um... I think you can all see that. I don't need to do it there. Um, Mike McCracken is bringing up a, a, what I think is a really important uh, issue. We have two communities to whom we have an obligation to let knowledge be the foundation of what we're doing. We're really good, all of us gathered here today, in my view, understanding all the subtleties, scientific details that uh, Jim articulates so well in the papers he references and the work he's done. On the other hand, we're gonna sit down with uh, <clears throat> some folks um, who are managing their coastal margin or they're 
trying to decide what they're going to do with their tourism and all the rest. They just can't get that. So uh, this particular diagram kind of buries all of that sort of stuff. It says when we um, have a large temperature difference between the equator and the pole, we have that tendency for that jet stream and other things to be fairly stable. Um, it's always been there, wiggles a bit and all the rest. On the other hand, when that temperature difference between the two regions, the pole and the equator, becomes less and less, uh, it's like a spring in there. It's letting it move around a lot more and we can have huge temperature differences of the order of 15 degrees centigrade, which is demonstrated. And then if you do that, then you can talk about something like this. It should be a thing that says this is a, a NASA um, data thing that the National <clears throat> Snow and Ice Data Center put together. That helps people understand, oh my gosh, that's what's happening. So Jim, talk to us about how we work with these two, uh, two communities of which are an organic part of B2B. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop the screen. Jim, you're mute, Jim. Put my slides up again. You know, I, I think the I think the point is to uh, 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 go over to the to the impacts that uh, go back one or, you know the one with the uh, walrus on it, the next one, you know other that one. Uh, you know here's here's my uh equivalent of of what uh, bob was showing where the wavy jet stream is pointing uh southerly winds over alaska and then the cold air dips down to uh, uh the eastern u.s and uh since the ice has been thinning all along, uh, when you add that warm air, you had uh, two winters where you had no ice in the in the Bering and in Chukchi, and and this impacted the whole ecosystem from the from the bottom. You you didn't have the juicy uh, 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 zooplankton for the fisheries and, and the walrus uh, didn't have any uh, uh, platform so they had to move on shore and were, were stressed. Uh, so I, I think uh, you know bring, bringing the whole the whole issue together uh, on that uh, when I when I started working on this, you know, I I, uh, I brought up as uh, Paul mentioned, you know, there's more uncertainty on these events, but uh, you know, I, uncertainty was a loaded word, so that's why it changed the title over to. Uh, more extreme events that yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect. You know, uh, uh, um, Jim, uh, a couple of years ago before this COVID thing, I, I was going from here to Washington, D.C., which is normally a three, two hour and 35, two hour and 45 minute trip. We landed in an hour and a half, and the pilot says, um, it's clear the jet stream we've been told by my weather people has already reached this far south and we're just riding those high speed winds that are on the on the right side of the polar vortex. Um, is that a fair description in your view? Oh, no, absolutely. And, and uh, I had the same event uh, going to Europe for one of the AMAP 
means that uh, we went from Seattle in uh, eight hours and or seven hours instead of ten hours. Right. And uh, and that that sort of goes along with uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> the figure I had from Richard Hall and, and for the uh, uh, the Siberian heat wave. Those are both examples of the uh, jet stream reaching further south. Uh, and it, it's hard to prove that all of those are uh, combined by uh, the change in the Arctic, but uh, there, there is certainly uh, anecdotal evidence for the, the case you're making. Well, that's why, I, that's why I put in there high latitude rather than putting it into a geographical region. To yeah, not so, so the... Uh, you know, the Siberian heat wave is a good example of uh, uh, it's never occurred before because that polar vortex uh, was uh, so far south. Yeah. Yeah, that village in northern, in, in the Siberian area of Russia had 104 degrees, 40 degrees C. Um, you know, th th those sorts of things help us to characterize this is these are some of the scientific realities but trying to put them in the terminology that some poor soul who never went to uh, even high school physics can begin to understand and those are people that are real they, they have good jobs they're smart like hell they just don't have the experience base to think um, about these things in the kind of but we have to do both I am not I'm not arguing against it we have to have the kind of discussion we just had where all of us here who have scientific backgrounds can begin to understand the subtleties, the details. And, and uh, Jim, in my view, you have characterized this issue better than anybody that I've ever been able to discover in your papers and your presentation. So we're really honored to have you join us and share that thinking today. I have a, I have a Paul and Karin and Mike, so Pearl first. Yes, uh, in B2B, 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 we uh, pay attention to the entire North Atlantic. And so we don't have, and many of us have been working in the Arctic and for very good reasons. Um, uh, but uh, we have to pay attention to other parts of the North Atlantic, which so far have not been thinking so much in terms of climate change, maybe. Uh, recently, I have, uh, have contacts with people in Spain. And uh, they tell me that the average temperature in Spain, continental Spain, has, uh, has risen with 1.6 degrees over 20 to 30 years, almost double the, um, uh, at the local scale, double the uh, uh, global average. And uh, certainly because of um, the pandemic and people have more t t time to worry about things, of course, the uh, one the half meter of snow in Madrid in the middle of uh, January uh, put a lot of uh, uh, let's say a disturbance into the um, uh, into the discussion. I know also that people in Croatia, where I've been working, they say that the winter is gone. We have only variability. Uh, so um, there is concern about climate change to be explained by the Arctic. Um, uh, in, in the south, where far more people live than where, where at least uh, I live or many other live. So um, I think there is currently maybe uh, the greatest concern for climate variability in the south and not in the north. In the north, somehow we know that's variable uh, and, and can take it much easier. But in the south, people are very worried and they are not, maybe the man on the street is not aware of that. The solution to understand what's going on is in the very far north. Mm. So this is something we have to have uh, in mind and have to argue for. Just a comment. No, I think it's a good comment. And just add to that, some of you know that some of us were asked to write papers for a thing called Global Asia. And I had, that I had never really looked carefully 
I found if you do the average of the country of China on the kind of scale we talk about, the average in, in uh, 2015 compared to that norm we had back about 1980 or whatever is 1.7 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is that if you look at the details, there's a deep gradation from the south which is closer to 1.2 or 3 to the high north, which is more like the numbers we've been talking about, 2 and 2.5 times the global mean. Well, what that, hap what that paper did was stimulate a conversation among us that we have to think like Paul is talking about. We have to see the implications of the stuff we observe in this higher latitude regions and how that plays out in the south. I think it makes a huge difference. And frankly, it's one of the reasons that urged some of us to move into and work on a B2B because it could be a connector to that larger enterprise. So uh, Paul, thank you very much. Well, how I would, would view that is, is on the Hannah slide that I had. You have the background warming, but then uh, uh, if you have the blocking over Greenland, that adds, uh, that adds to the uh, storms coming in over southern, southern Europe. So it's the combination of the background precursors, and then you add the, the variability on top of it that moves you to a place you've never been before. And I think I go to Karin. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have two comments, one or question. One is uh, ecosystems are actually geared to withstand, let's say, one year of an extreme event. Usually they recover. It's a question of repetitive um, impact. So a, a drought one year will not really harm agriculture, but it, if it happens every second year, then we will have a major issue. So we really need to find out also uh, the timing, whether things are happening uh, repetitively. Another point is, uh, this is a question, one of the biggest impact worldwide would be an impact on the monsoon system. And the question, this is further south than what Paul mentioned. Is there, I mean, is there any, view on how the monsoon system could be impacted by the changes in the Atlantic? Perlis uh, <laughs> or Jim, do you have any? Jim's Mark, hey Jim, there you go. Yeah, the, uh, uh, you know, I think that's, that's the main point about these uh, rare events impacting the life history. Uh, where, you know, they, they can handle one or two extreme events in a decade, but if, uh, you know, we start doubling that, that's, that's where what we'll have the real impact. So your, uh, your model there, I think, is, is how it works and how we need to uh, th think about the the impacts and that they may happen on a next decade or two, not the next five decades. Uh, uh, on, on the monsoon, uh, there's the Asian monsoon and there, there's a monsoon uh, over Texas and, and that area and uh, the uh, <clears throat> the loss of ice in the Barents Sea helps lock in the wavy jet stream over Eastern Asia and then it it uh, interacts with the uh, monsoon coming out of Southeast Asia so the amount of snow and temperature and all of that is is the fight between the cold air coming down and 
and the moist monsoon uh, coming up. So, uh, you know, my my Far East uh, colleagues tend to look at that uh, war between the new cold air coming down and, and uh, the warming uh, and change from the monsoon down there. And so that, that as Robert says, that steepens the uh, difference uh, between the air masses there and, and is having more severe weather because of the fight between the monsoon and, and the art. Thank you. Then I have uh, Mike and Jack uh, before we put the line here. We'll see if we soon be on ongoing. Okay, Bob, last. So, but, uh, but I think we'll go to Mike first. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I wanted to react a, a bit to what Bob said. It, it's sort of been my impression over the years that one contributor to there being sort of greater uh, uncertainty or deniers or whatever in the, in the United States and Europe is that at least Western Europe is sort of the size of one weather system. So everybody's sort of getting something reasonably similar um, at one time where the US is the size of multiple weather systems. And so you're often having opposite effects in what's happening on the East Coast and the West Coast, hot and dry or wet and cool or whatever it is. And, and for many years, that actually has been a problem in getting the American weather broadcasters to actually be talking about it, seeing it as climate change instead of variability. Um, and so they, there was a special program that people have put together to try and help people at least convince the weather broadcasters. So Bob, when you're talking about going out to the public, I guess I think we ought to see if we can learn from how they convince the weather broadcasters. I mean, those are science people who should be able to understand right, right. about wave changes and things like that. And yet they had a great deal of trouble about it and were the really slow community in the science part to come around to this notion of climate change being important as compared to just variability. I mean, that climate change was underlying changes in variability. So, so we ought to see if we can learn from that community about how to communicate this. Because I think it's going to be really hard when you say different things are happening in different places to convince people that, oh, that's all changed due to the same thing of emissions of CO2 or something. Thank you. Well. Next is Jack, you ask for the, the floor. Uh, I don't, I didn't really mean to, but I just made a comment when Paul was talking. Um, you see a lot more and more people uh, trying to stress the point that the Arctic is really connected to the mid latitudes. And there's a common phrase, what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. And I think that's kind of what Bob was trying to make in, with his uh, wavy jet stream. but. There was this whole discussion about pedagogy and how do we actually get people to understand this complication. And, and I just wanted to follow up on what Mike just said. The, another scientific community that has, maybe they're coming around now, but climatologists were very resistant to climate change because they, they like to look at these 30 and 50 year averages and extra, you know the, the bounds. But a lot of like state climatologists in the US were very resistant to to accepting that there was anthropogenic hey, climate boy, change. In, indeed, yes. Uh, indeed, indeed. Very good. All right, Bob, do you want to have the final word? Well, I want to pick up on, uh, I think it was Jim's last, near the last slide about ecosystems. And I'd like to propose a, an idea that was born uh, in a meeting a couple of years ago, three years ago, that Dennis Ojima and Thomas Roswell and others pull together and ask the question, what, what are the trends and patterns in ecosystems that we're gonna have to worry about and think about in this dynamic arena that we have to live in? And it ended up talking extensively about optimal species temperatures. And I think Karen hit it with a, a bat right out of the park because she said, that you know, if you got one event, the system just kind of bubbles along and merry away. But this uh, optimal species temperature, in effect, has an integrator in it. If it gets hit twice, 
that becomes a part of the integration across time scales. And well, I think we might want to look among us, particularly those of you who have strong ecological backgrounds, uh, to look at this dynamic that we have some tools of use optimal species temperatures as a basis. Um, I mean, it was one of the things that drove the famous diagram we had in, in ACIA about fish moving northward. This is all about optimal temperatures. If you go to Maine, they'll tell you why the, the lobsters have gone northward. It's all about their optimal temperature. And they're precisely as Karen talked about it. One event, um, you know, it's not going to make a difference. A, a hundred year storm probably doesn't make a bit of difference in the system. But but when you start hitting the system, the integration takes place. So I propose that one of the times we talk about that and with ideas of particularly those who are smarter about e ecology than I am, I'd welcome the opportunity to talk more about it. Thank you, uh, uh, Lars Otto. Well, thank you. I think that was a good summing up here. We've been talking about this important issue for nearly one hour. So thank you everyone for your contributions and um, Jenny has now made up the um, announcement of the uh, next meeting in May 26. That's uh, Stefan Hines um, from Galway University in Ireland will speak here about the evaluation of the North Atlantic Ecosystem Services benefits to society. So that would be a, an interesting presentation where we try to come into the more economic part here. We have been very much into the physical chemical so that's an interesting next week. No, not, not next week, but next meeting coming up here.